Thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone for joining and uh, your interest in Kanban. I've been looking very much forward to this because uh, as you mentioned, when, uh, uh, when it comes to the agenda for today, we are going to uh, try and use some of the Kanban techniques in practice. Uh, I'm not going to tell you too much about myself. I've been working with uh, agile systems from basically any angle you can possibly think of. Uh, and I've been doing that for the past 13 years. And before that, I was employed in uh, uh, several of the big global companies, such as Digital, Compaq, uh, HP, and Avanard. But for 13 years, I've been an independent consultant. I'm also working as a volunteer for Kanban University, as well as for Project Management Institute. But uh, with no further ado, I'll just continue with uh, uh, my presentation and uh, you have actually presented, thank you for that, Anna, uh, the agenda. And uh, I just want to, um, uh, to manage expectations here. So in fact, we are putting a two day Kanban training session together and going through it in maybe 20 minutes or so. So uh, we are only scratching the surface, but I hope that we are uh, getting to, to the point where you, can, where you can understand a bit more about what Kanban is. We'll start with setting the scene and then looking into the Kanban myths. And then this uh, uh, two days training condensed breakout room, looking a bit at the differences between uh, Scrum, SAFE and Kanban because those are uh, the, the frameworks that people can usually relate to. And then I'm going to introduce you to systems thinking approach to implementing Kanban, also known as static. Then another breakout room, and then we close down. So if you're looking at agile transformations in general, there are some conditions around those. Um, I was thinking I was in uh, kind of a, a, a philosophical mood one day looking at the moon and then I was thinking that actually it reminds me of what I'm doing uh, in agile transformations and implementations on the daily basis. Uh, all the easy stuff is visible and transparent and all the difficult things are hidden underneath the surface. Uh, the easy stuff, that might be the method, doesn't matter if it's Scrum or Kanban or the PMI method, whatever, but here you can find plenty of books written about it. You can find um, uh, blogs, you can find articles, you can find many different things that can explain to you, this is what the method about is about and this is what you're supposed to do. But the difficult stuff, that's the hidden thing. That's all the things that has to do with your organizational culture, your readiness for change, um, error tolerance, your maturity, management style, all these things. And you can't see a binder or a book written about this is the culture in our company and, and this is how our mindset is supposed to be. But all of these things on the dark side of the moon is actually what's going to determine whether or not you are going to be successful with your agile initiative, whatever that might be. It's also very difficult to get rid of silo thinking. And what you see here is quite a, a, a normal setup in a company where you have different areas, different departments. But when you're looking at somebody getting a new idea, a new project, a new initiative, then the only thing uh, the customer is uh, worried about is the lead time. How long time is it going to take from I get this bright idea until I have the solution or the package in my hands? When you're looking at Scrum, Scrum is very concerned about how the team collaborates. It's a collaboration model and there are roles and responsibilities divided uh, between the different members of the Scrum team. Kanban, on the other hand, is focused on what happens in the total value chain, you can say. And uh, we are uh, very focused on lead times and we are distinguishing between two different types of lead time. The system lead time, which is the, lead, the time it takes for a task to move from one end to the other in a single team 
and then it moves on to the next team. They have their system lead time, putting it all together, adding to that the wait time. This is where you will find the customer lead time. Kanban is very focused on reducing all sorts of wait times and improve the system. Kanban is looking at what we call flow efficiency. You may have heard about it. And that is in fact about reducing wait time. And now I'm going to reveal to you something that might be quite shocking. And uh, have, had we been in a uh, in a face-to-face -face scenario, I would have asked you as, uh, as the audience, so how, where do you think the flow efficiency will usually be? What kind of percentage would you think uh, would be normal? And the first time I heard it, I actually got a shock because it has been measured all across the globe and it's not unusual to see flow efficiencies around three to 4%. That means that there'll be a waste in the size of 95, even more in your system. And that is, that is uh, because of wait times, because of blockers, between, uh, because of cross-team dependencies and all these nasty things. And if you get your flow efficiency in the neighborhood of 40, this is actually very, very good. And I thought that was quite thought provoking because that means that even if you're doing good, then you will still have waste in your system uh, in the size of about 60%. And again, this has been measured. It's, it is not just a, a gut feeling or anything like this. This is cold hard data. And now I wonder, uh, are there any questions when we are uh, uh, about uh, the general points of agile transformations? I don't know if something has turned up in the chat. Nothing yet in the chat. Nothing yet, but at least now we have set the stage for for uh, for the next part, which is about what Kanban is uh, in the first place. The reason for me setting this stage is that there might be a tendency to think that agile in, uh, transformations, they're just easy and agile is simple, but this is really not the case. Uh, no is Kanban when it comes to the point. But the definition of Kanban by David Anderson, whom you see here in the picture, is that Kanban is pragmatic, actionable, evidence-based guidance. That means it's based on data and it, uh, it provides suggestions to exactly how you can make your system work. And I'll explain more about that later. Kanban is a flow system. And the purpose of this kind of flow system is to deliver as much as possible, as efficiently as possible in the right quality. So that you could say this is the definition of agile when you're looking at it from a Kanban point of view. Uh, if someone were to ask me, so Aneta, how long time is it going to take you from to, to go by car from where you live? I live in a place called Holde, uh, not too far away from Copenhagen. How far? How long time will it take you to go from Holde to Copenhagen? Then my answer would be that certainly depends on what time of day that I'm traveling. If I'm traveling in the morning, then it might take me an hour, even more. If I travel uh, late in the evening, I can do it in 20 minutes. So my efficiency and anybody's efficiencies, that depends on how long time activities are lying still and waiting. What we are looking for when we are creating our Kanban system is to create a system where we can get our activities smoothly from the beginning to the end of that system. We want to remove waste we want to, to make sure that we have as few delays as at all possible. So we are trying to create a system that is more like the one on the left-hand side compared to the one on the right-hand side. And one important point to make here is that for years and years, uh, managers have been talking about utilization. Organizations have been talking about utilization. They're very concerned about are our resources fully utilized? But I would suggest that you should instead 
uh, focus on flow. Because if you have a system like the one to the right hand side where the roads are fully utilized, you have used the full capacity of this system, but nothing is flowing. Everything is coming to a standstill. And the same goes, and I'm sure I heard that many of you were agile coaches, RTEs, uh, scrum masters, etc. You will also have experienced that if you utilize your resources to the maximum, flow is going to deteriorate and they're going to be maxed out and stressed. This is the system that we do not want. We want the one on the left-hand side. There are also many myths about the Kanban method. So I would like to uh, kill some of those myths. Some of the myths is that Kanban, well, that's something primitive. It's only a task board. And uh, it's just a matter of having a board. And then you have a lot of uh, yellow sticky notes many of them floating around uh, at random. And this is absolutely not the case. Uh, Kanban is not a project management method or a software development process or anything, anything like that. And another one of the most, uh, 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 the, the myths that I hear most often is that Kanban is only for small teams. It's only for operations teams or people doing simple things. It's not correct. So let me tell you about what Kanban actually is. It is a management method that will directly improve the way that you're delivering your services, whatever that might be. It catalyzes improvement. It's not a, a big bang thing, but over time you'll see improvements and you will get organizational agility growing and growing and growing as time goes. And it's evolving your business to be fit for purpose. In fact, Kanban can be used for any kind of knowledge work. So wherever you're using your head to produce something, then you can Kanbanize the way you're working. So that means that you can use it in marketing, in HR, communications, and certainly also in uh, IT uh, development or IT uh, department systems, projects, whatever. Anywhere you are delivering services of, of some kind, you can utilize Kanbans, the Kanban method. There are some building blocks in the Kanban method. And uh, they consist of the general practices. We've got three of those. There are three service delivery principles. And then we have some change management principles. And they're all surrounded with the values uh, of Kanban. And I tend to see the values as the glue that's making the system stick together. So if we start with the three principles for service delivery, uh, Kanban tends to look at uh, any organization as a network of independent or interdependent services. And if you look at your own organization, you'll see that there are, there are many different groups of people, teams, departments, whatever, projects that are delivering services, but usually they can't do it on their own. They're depending on somebody else to help them with things that they do not have the, um, the competencies to uh, complete. The policies in this system is actually determining the way that the system behaves. So what we're trying to do is to focus and understand what is it our customer actually need. We want to manage the customer's expectation and we also want to manage the work. In Kanban, there's also a principle of self-organization, but that's actually not trivial. If you, uh, uh, if you ask a team, please, can you organize yourself? Uh, there might be many questions about what do you mean? Self, how can we self-organize in what way? And are there any boundaries? Questions like that. So it, it may sound simple and it's easy to write, but it's not that simple to make it function in real life. Principle number three is to regularly review the network and its policies to improve outcomes. And it's very, it's very usual that you see that people are working the way that they always did and they're not, uh, they not having any inspect and adapt uh, uh, principles in the way that they are working between teams and across teams. 
And this is what we are asking people to do. Have a look at the network and the way you are, you are working together and fix, fix it if there's something that doesn't work. So these were the three principles for service delivery. Then the change management principles. And here there's one of the biggest differences between Kanban and basically any other agile framework or method. We start with what we would do now. This means that we do not want any revolutions in terms of uh, the processes that we're using or the roles and responsibilities, job titles, whatever. There is a strong belief that uh, successful businesses, they are successful for a reason. So there, are, there, are, there might be good reasons for the company to be structured in the way that they are. And therefore we don't want to disturb anything that's working well. But we start with what we do now, and then we move over to principle number two, gain agreement to pursue improvement through evolutionary change. And that's, the, uh, that's uh, another big difference. Uh, there is a strong belief that when you're introducing evolutionary change and you're changing things bit by bit, then they'll get stuck as good habits in the teams, in the Kanban teams, in the organization. And it's going to be easier to absorb compared to big revolution, uh, big revolutions where you change a lot of things at the same time. People have to get used to new roles, new responsibilities. Uh, organizational changes are always uh, disruptive. So we are trying to create as little disruption as we can, but yet we are going for evolutionary change and moving once one step after the next. The third change management principle is to encourage acts of leadership at all levels. We want each individual in the Kanban system to take responsibility and uh, uh, assume accountability for whatever they're doing. And we are most of, most of the people that, that uh, I've been working with, they have a lot to say over their own uh, daily work. Uh, very few people have a manager sitting watching them 24-7 uh, to see, are you, are you busy? Are you doing something? And that means that you do have a lot of responsibility yourself in the way that your everyday work life is uh, playing out. And uh, Kanban is encouraging that each and every one of us are assuming that leadership. So whenever we see something that is not working well, that might be improved, then we're going to raise our hands and say, by the way, did you see that this and this happened? Or have you seen that there are certain things that we might be looking at in our system that we, we could improve? Uh, this, is, this is the behavior that we want. We want a behavior where, where you are showing leadership in any way that's possible for you. It's not that we are all going to be CEOs of, or, or, or high level managers, of course not, but we can. We can do whatever we can do at whatever level we are working on. And this is what we want from our employees and our uh, fellow uh, colleagues in the Kanban system. And now over to maybe the most important part of the Kanban system. That's the six general practices. And this is actually the how-to in Kanban. And this is what I was aiming at when we were talking about actionable guidance when David defined the Kanban method. We are telling uh, Kanban, the Kanban method is showing you exactly what you need to do to create a robust uh, working system. The first thing you need to do is you need to visualize because if you want to have evolutionary improvements or any other kind of improvements for that matter, we need to see what's going on. Who's working on what? What does our workflow look like? Uh, uh, who's, who's responsible for what? We have, we have uh, visualized uh, rules and politics and uh, anything that can possibly uh, guide us in the way that we're working with our system. And as it says here, no skinny mirrors. We want to see everything. When I stand in front of the mirror, I know that I might benefit from losing a few kilos, but it doesn't help me if I'm looking in one of these skinny mirrors where I look as if I'm 10 pounds thinner than I actually am. And the same goes for Kanban. We want to see everything that's going on, good and bad, because that's our foundation for improvements. 
secondly, and very importantly, limit work in progress. And I can't stress this enough because this is maybe the, the, the biggest source of improvements that you could ever think of. Stop starting and start finishing. That's, uh, that's one of the Kanban mantras. We want to avoid stopping a lot of things because when you have a lot of things going on for you, then there's a uh, then you can actually task switch as often as you want to without ever completing anything and this is one of the reasons why we limit work in progress because the less you have going on at the same time the quicker everything will move and you also try to uh, get a balance between how much you have going on and the capacity that you have in your team and the third thing is manage flow. And to manage flow, you need data. And this is where we are talking about the evidence-based part. We need to have cold, hard data to tell us how are we actually doing. And one of the things we are measuring is the movement of work and our lead times that I talked about before. We want to know our lead times because lead times, they are reality. This is what actually happened, independent on any uh, estimation that we might have done or any forecasts that's, that we might have given. The lead time is the time it actually took to complete a certain thing. And we want our flow to be smooth and predictable, just like you saw on the motorway just before. We want people, we want our tasks uh, and, and our employees to be able to maneuver freely and to complete quickly when uh, the tasks are moving through our workflow. The next thing we want to do is to make our policies explicit. And the reason for doing that is that we are all different and we all have different uh, ways of thinking, different values, different this and different that. So if I were to think about how I would, uh, how, how I would um, define quality, it's most likely going to be different from what anybody else in this, uh, in this meeting uh, would be thinking. We all have our ideas about how things are uh, going. What is quality like? When are we complete? Somebody might think we are done once I'm done with my development and others might say, hey, shouldn't we test it too? So because we are thinking so differently about the same thing, we want to discuss them and agree the policies and make them visible to everyone that's involved. We want to have clear pull criteria. We want to have visible whip limits. Uh, we want to work with classes of service, and I'm going to get back to this in a while. We want to see our dependencies and our blockers because they are disturbing the flow. So everything is kind of uh, tied together in uh, this system. The fifth thing that, that we want is to establish feedback loops. So instead of, uh, again, if you can relate to Scrum, which I'm sure that most of you can, you everything is evolving around a sprint and you are having uh, meetings at a certain uh, time during that sprint, where in the Kanban system, we'll meet at the cadence that is appropriate for that particular meeting. And, uh, I'll get back to the feedback loops uh, in a while so you can see what kind of meetings we're suggesting would be good ideas. But what we want to do, we want to learn from them and we want to get data out of those meetings so, uh, so we can make robust decisions based on data. Actually, we are talking to anybody that can help us improve the flow of our system. And the last thing is to improve collaboratively and evolve experimentally. We want the team to always be aware of where there might be opportunities for improvement. We're using a hypothesis driven change using the scientific method, but basically we're talking about the plan, do, check, act circle that's, uh, that's part of the agile DNA. We're also running what we call safe to fail experiments. We're trying things out on the smaller scale. If they work, we spread them out, use them at the bigger scale. If they don't work, we throw them away. And we may have wasted a bit of time 
a, a bit of money, but not too bad. So rather than having these grand changes, we are looking at smaller changes that, that we uh, can see will be working, and then we roll them out. These are the six practices, and these are exactly the things that you need to do to build your Kanban system. Classes of service and cost of delay is also an important part of a, the Kanban method. And um, I would say that if you were to do only two things to improve whatever system you're working with, I would limit work in progress and I would work with class of service. Class of service is a matter of determining what is more important than other, uh, what tasks are more important than other things. And uh, as an analogy, analogy I can, I can mention uh, an airport. You will have first class passengers you will have business class passengers and you will have monkey class passengers such as myself, but that difference in the way that they're treated. The first class passengers, they might be moving quickly through security and when they are in the airplane, they'll get nice porcelain cups and uh, they'll get champagne and whatever. Uh, monkey class passengers will usually be drinking their coffee from plastic cups and they'll have to buy a meal if they want one. So we are behaving in a different way, depending on what kind of activities we are talking about. And in Kanban, we have four different classes of service that are uh, usually enough to, to handle a full Kanban system. The first one is, uh, uh, the first one is the expedite class of service. This is the kind of all hands on deck activity where you do not care about, about prioritization, something bad has happened and you just need to go and fix it now. An example could be that a system uh, breaks down and uh, nobody in the company can work on, on anything. Of course, you don't need to discuss whether it should be prioritized now, you should just fix it. And we are if we're looking at the cost of delay function, it'll have an immediate financial impact. You must fix it immediately or it'll become very expensive for you. The second class of service is the fixed date class of service. And in Kanban, uh, a deadline, a fixed date, is not an arbitrary date, but it's a date where something bad is going to happen. Uh, if we don't meet this deadline, it's going to be very costly. And this can be seen again on the cost of delay function where the impact at the moment may be next to nothing, but once the deadline is reached, the cost will rise immediately. It'll skyrocket if you don't deliver by the deadline. The third one, the green one, is the standard class of service. And this is just a, a usual task. It's something that happens, uh, that, that arrives to us because that's why we were hired in the first place. And uh, they, they are important, but it's nothing that's too costly, maybe over time, but not right now. It's simply a task that we do because this is what we were hired for. Then the last one, the blue one, is the intangible class of service. And there might not be an external customer for these kinds of tasks, um, but they may, may be, they may be investments in the future. It could be that you could automate some kind of testing or uh, you need to upgrade a system because it runs out of service. And if something happens to the system, when there's no longer any service on it, it might be very costly. And this is what you can see when you look at the uh, cost of delay function, where the impact right now is really nothing, but then once you get later out in the future, it might be very costly. And the thing is that you might have an activity that starts as an intangible activity, and then as time passes, it may change to be a standard activity, and then if you don't get it fixed soon enough, you might need to put a deadline on it. It becomes a yellow fixed date activity. And if you still are not uh, done when you get closer to the deadline, it gets to become an expedite kind of activity. So you might change the class of service as time passes. And now for one of the, the biggest secrets in Kanban, uh, actually Kanban works with two separate boards and downstream board, which is for committed work, and an upstream board, which is for the options. And again, I'm condensing a two-day course. 
and just giving you the highlights here. So on the right hand side, you will have the downstream board and you can see that the workflow is continuing beyond testing, but we don't know where it's going to end. On the left hand side, you have the upstream Kanban, which is uh, consisting of options. And not until it reaches the downstream board at the committed column, you will have the commitment point. And this is the place where the person that's asked you to do a certain service or, or activity is absolutely sure that this activity is needed. And you as a team, you are absolutely sure that you have the competencies and the capacity to complete them. So the downstream Kanban consists of committed work, the upstream of options, and they remain uh, optional and unprioritized and you can reject them. And this is what people are usually not very good at. When they get a, a request to do something, uh, the normal reaction is to say, yes, of course, because there is uh, an assumption that if somebody is asking for something, they probably need it. But unless you handle it in a structured way, you might be doing something that's less valuable than something else you have on your upstream board. And this is why we want you to analyze it thoroughly so you're absolutely sure that whatever you're doing downstream where you're utilizing your scarce resources is of optimum value. So we are asking people to ask themselves, do we really want it or, or is it not really necessary? And in that case, you will reject it. And you have minimum and maximum uh, limits to ensure that there are enough options to move into the downstream board in case the committed column gets empty and you have prioritized the next things that are the, candid the candidates for the downstream board. You have uh, uh, the reason why we want to do it this way is that it's much more expensive to spend your scarce resources on developing something and then halfway uh, the one asking for it uh, comes by and say, well, by the way, I don't need it anyway. Then you have simply been wasting the time of your resources. We don't want that. We want them to spend enough time to, to uh, help analyzing whether this is something worthwhile doing. And if you want to throw it away, you should throw it away in the upstream Kanban mode. We have two roles that have emerged over time. You don't have to call it service delivery manager. It could be a project manager. It could be a flow manager. Some call it Kanban master. Some call it something else. Doesn't really matter. But we need somebody that's interested in how the work is flowing through our system because we need the data to understand uh, what decisions we need to make or are there improvements that we need to discuss, anything like that. We want to have somebody that's looking at blockers, at dependencies, stuff like that. Uh, hopefully in collaboration with that team, but somebody should have the responsibility for the downstream board. And the same goes for the upstream board. This role is usually called the service request manager, and he or she is the one making sure that we get this uh, upstream Kanban board organized and we get the activities sorted and prioritized and rejected and whatever else needs to happen. Uh, and usually, actually always with the help of some of the guys or per people working downstream. So this is the way that uh, the Kanban system works uh, in practice. And we have very little going on downstream, goes with the limiting work in progress, but there are always things ready to be moved into the downstream board once they're ready. So when we're talking about data-driven systems, what do we measure and why do we do it? Well, basically you can measure everything, but the usual uh, metrics in Kanban are the lead time. You cannot, uh, you cannot rule lead time out because this is actually the main metric of any Kanban system. Throughput, very useful, and the blockers absolutely and very definitely uh, how long are things blocked? Why do they occur? Can they be minimized? Can we talk to somebody? Can we make some agreements with other departments or whatever else? Flow efficiency requires high data discipline, and I'm not going to dig more into that. Uh, you can also measure quality. 
how many errors have you corrected uh, in the period that you're measuring and how many uh, new errors have arrived so when you focus fl on flow then you have to measure speed and efficiency uh, when you measure quality this affects customer satisfaction and productivity and some also measure employee satisfaction from a scale in this case from one to six and that's because happy employees are simply more productive so we want to uh, focus on measuring so we know what we want to improve what needs to be improved and how we're going to go about it and if you were to ask yourself why are we talking about kanban and systems thinking well the answer is that we want to avoid sub optimization in teams and create a holistic view of what is most important and that's getting back to the silos i showed you just before if you can get agreement across different silos about what is more important than other things then you are in a better place than if you don't we also want to make a joint and determined effort to minimize waiting time we want to have a look at bottlenecks these are usually what's uh, looked at as bloggers in kanban systems uh, cross team dependencies and such and now uh, time for questions if there are any we have a minute or so for that Let's see, then nothing has uh, come to the chat, so uh, you, are welcome, you are welcome to unmute yourselves. One quick question. What's the difference between backlog refinement and uh, taking care of the upstream board in Kanban? So well, you, can, uh, you can actually compare those because it is, a, it is an activity of refining whatever is there. So you, you're not working just with headlines. We want to avoid guesswork and we want to understand what does it take to complete this particular task. So you're doing it uh, uh, not as uh, detailed as you will once you get into the downstream board, but you want to know enough so you know should we discard it or should we keep it in our upstream. Thanks for that question. Um, okay. I have a question too on the net, uh, if I may. Sure. Okay, uh, you talked about a measure lead time, and my question is: Do you have a tool which you can measure really great the lead time when you're using Jira? I know you can see it, but you can't have a graphic out of this. Uh, do you have a tip? Uh, you were talking about using Jira. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Jira is, uh, is is not the best for Kanban, to be honest. I know that there are. Uh, Kanban boats in Jira, but it's not the best. And you can, yes, you can definitely measure lead time there. Uh, I, I know that there is an extension to Jira called Nave, where you can, where you can, uh, uh, where, where it, 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 it's working the Kanban way. It's making Jira working the Kanban way, if you will, where, where all these metrics are handled in, in, in the way that you would do normally yeah. if you were working with a Kanban software. Yeah. Great, it's called NIV. Could you write it in the chat? Would it be possible? Uh, absolutely. Let me see. Annette. Thank you, Annette, yeah. very much. Uh, a follow up question to, to what you just mentioned that you didn't like or you didn't prefer Jira. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit what you are thinking about when you say that? When I'm saying that it doesn't, it doesn't work too well for Kanban? Uh, is that what you mean? Yes, exactly. I'm curious. Yeah, about I mean, there, there, there are many things that you would want to do to visualize, for instance, blocker, blocker clustering, the time something has been blocked, so you can take out that data from uh, from the system. And uh, Jira really, honestly, is not ideal for that. And I would not, I, I'm, I, I'm not too fond of going into a too detailed discussion about about, about software systems because uh, because it's I'm, I'm not trying to offend anybody here. But Jira was not built for Kanban. There are other systems that are, which I would strongly recommend if you if you would like to go the the, the Kanban way or uh, use Nave uh, as an add-on to Jira because that that works perfectly fine. But but uh, native Jira is 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 not built for for Kanban systems and the way we are visualizing and measuring what we need to to measure in Kanban systems, unfortunately. 
Then we have some more questions in the chat here, so I'm going to read them for you, Annette. Yeah. What ceremonies is used then reject or is it ad hoc activity? Well, you uh, you you have again you have explicit rules, and then you would have you you would have some rules about what to uh, reject and what not to reject, and of course that's based on the value you want to create. Uh, so so it has to do with the the explicit rules of the system. It's not something you do at random. Well, I don't feel like making this, so I reject it. This is not the way it works. It's something where you would usually have uh, you would have decision power. You would have usually you would have managers and i'll get back to the replenishment meetings in after uh, and and we we, we can't uh, we mustn't take too much time so you don't have time to go out in the breakout rooms okay. uh, uh, but but there are there are um you do have decision makers uh, uh, sitting in the replenishment meetings where where you're working with your upstream kanban and they have to agree what to reject and what not to reject and that's what I mean when we're talking about having a holistic view of what uh, creates value and what doesn't. I, I hope this is uh, uh, an answer to that. Uh, I would like actually to, to give it to Alex. He has uh, three reflections that he would like to share with us. Please go ahead, Alex. Thank you. Okay, so, so there were three things that uh, stood out for me a bit and the first one was about the incremental versus the transformative change so mm -hmm. at what point does the kanban system acknowledge the need for transformative change if at all well you do that all the time basically because you will uh, imagine i mean have I, I i don't think any of us have ever worked in a system where we were not blocked in some way so you would decide, you, you would look at what is blocking your flow. And again, data driven, all the rest of it. And you will see that on a daily basis. And then you would have, I mean, in Scrum, you, you, you have these ceremonies where, where you're, you're doing it uh, every second Tuesday of the month, you're doing certain things. Uh, in Kanban, you would have cadences. And you may agree that we, we want to have a look at this once a week, once every second week, once every month or whatever you agree what is fitting for your system and it could be that you want to look at it more often in the beginning compared to once you get more mature and and everything is kind of more impli or, uh, yeah, implicit in the system but the triggers for for uh, for changing something is the lead uh, is the lead are the lead times uh, because if you have immensely long lead times and you can see a lead time distribution that goes between, I'm just putting up some numbers now, between five and 72 days, then there's something that needs fixing because that's too strange that the same type of activity would vary from five to 72 days. Uh, so uh, again, not going too deep into this, but it's the data that that's, uh, I mean, what you see in your system will be reflected in the data that you're maintaining and that data will show to you what do we need to have a look at. If we get blocked all the time and the lead times become very long, then we need to have a look at the blockers. Why are we blocked? Is there something we can actually do about this? Is it because we are starting things too soon? Are we depending on somebody what we didn't go talk to them uh, proactively so it gets blocked? Or do we get too much? Oops, where did that come from? Then it's a behavioral thing that we may need to look at. So we, we see what's happening in our system, and then we from that we determine uh, what to uh, what to uh, improve uh, and what to leave. And then we are we are usually you won't uh, work with more than a few things. One, two, I would say absolutely max three, because we want this incremental improvement that that gets stuck as good habits. All right. Uh, if I move on with the second one, I think someone else wrote it in the chat, but you said that it's uh, ideally not prioritized in the upstream Kanban. So why is it not uh, prioritized in the pool of IDs? So I basically have an idea if I, if I start analyzing the right things here. Exactly. And, and that's a very good question. And, and all questions have actually been very good because, uh, yeah, they've, they have touched upon some very important points. The reason why we don't want to do uh, too much too early in the Kanban system is exactly like with Scrum, 
We don't analyze what's lowest in our backlog until it becomes relevant. But we want to analyze just enough to make sure that we can kick out the activities that are not important enough and, 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 and keep the activities that are. And then once it gets closer to the downstream board, then we, we, we may want to prioritize the, the, the first five or something like that. So we always have a picture of what would be the next five most important things in case the downstream board uh, there's room to move things upstream from upstream to downstream, but we wouldn't want to spend all a, a whole lot of time with 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 stuff getting in because uh, uh, things are usually very volatile. It changes a lot. So we, if we spend too much time to analyze everything, we might be uh, we might be looking at new things that are moving uh, uh, kind of. Um, um, or, or, or pressing themselves in front of what we already analyzed, and that would be a waste of time. So it's a matter of analyzing just enough to determine still relevant, yes or no. If not, kick it out. If yes, we leave it there. Uh, and 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 the the uh, the process you use for analyzing, uh, uh, that's up to you to determine. What do we want to look at? Is it the cost? Is it the risk? Is it the uh, Certainly the value that's uh, you need to look at the value no matter what, but that can be different, there can be different criteria for analyzing upstream and that's up to each organization or each team even to determine what is it that. Uh, makes an activity make it or get kicked out uh, from our upstream system so it's it's very flexible. All right, so some kind of pra pragmatic uh, ha handling of that. Okay, so the last reflection here. Uh, you talked about two different roles here, and and it it what what I'm used to is more that you have like a product owner or product manager or something like that 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 has the customer and the value and going all the way. Doesn't it? Doesn't we uh, introduce a risk here with some kind of handover and a, a miscommunication with the value mm -hmm. of whatever we are moving in the in the Canva system from the SRM to the SDM? Uh, not really, because it's uh, you can say that the, the, the service delivery manager is focused on flow and the service delivery manager would usually take uh, uh, take uh, participate in the meetings where you're working with the upstream board as well. And this service uh, request manager is not it, it is a person that that uh, says okay uh, i'm going to i'm going to um, make sure that the upstream kanban is maintained but at those meetings there will be all anybody that's asking a team to do anything will be present at that meeting so that once you have agreed the priorities everybody's in agreement everybody are in agreement and that means that that it's it's uh, you don't need to uh, like the product owner you would have uh, a set of, of um, uh, what's it called now, um, stakeholders. You will have a set of stakeholders that you need to uh, talk to to make sure that you are in alignment. But this is, uh, this is formalized in the replenishment meeting that I'll return to later. Um, so um, so that, uh, did, did that uh, give you an explanation about how risk is controlled in, in the Kanban system? It's yeah, a different think, way of dealing with it, you could say. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, yeah, maybe something to learn from. I, I'm not used to it, so, so I have to think about it. But I think that was a good enough answer for now. So thank, thank you very much. much. You're welcome. And now we are in trouble because we have spent uh, quite some time uh, with answers and questions. And I think that's quite all right. But I do think that we're going to uh, to have only one exercise this this uh, this uh, afternoon uh, dash evening, so that there's plenty of room for 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 questions too. I think that it's not it's not feasible to do both, to be honest. But mm -hmm. I think we should go ahead with this one. What do you think, Anna? Yeah, I think you're right because we also have more questions in the chat that uh, haven't been answered yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe let's uh, focus on the discussions instead and do one exercise. Okay, so if if. Uh, we want to have a meeting where our time is spent in the best possible way. Mm. So if there are many questions, let's go ahead and, and, and just, uh, is it for now or something that we should? Uh... 
maybe we can take the rest of the questions after the breakout. Yes. I think it's high time for us to jump yes. into the breakout. So please go ahead and, and, and let's do you introduce Excellent. it, Anita. Mm. Okay, so the first exercise, and, and this is what we are doing when we are, are trying to create Kanban systems. We want to have a look at the sources of dissatisfaction. And what do we mean by that? It's, these are things that you would like to be different. And you are looking at what's internal to your team and what's external to your team. So uh, in the next, yeah, do we have, uh, sorry, do we still have 20 minutes? Do you think we should spend 20 minutes in the breakout rooms? We can do 15 minutes instead. We do no 15 problem. minutes, great. Let's do 15 so minutes. So what you want to discuss during those 15 minutes is what is stopping you from delivering activities uh, to your deadlines in the right quality? Do you have any conflicts? What makes you annoyed with people outside your team? And do you collaborate efficiently as a team? Anything that's concerned with how your team is uh, working and how people are, uh, uh, how, how you are working with people, uh, uh, or, or what, how you are looking at people outside your team. Like these guys, they always do this, that or the other. And I know that you're not working in the same place but I'm almost willing to bet my house that you're going to find many of the same things. Uh, looking at the external, how, how do you think that people outside your team uh, are looking at you? Do they have any complaints? Are they saying something that you don't like? Why are they getting annoyed? And can you see a pattern? Uh, we don't have sticky notes here, but I know that, sorry, you have, uh, you have prepared uh, a sheet for each breakout room. Uh, yep. The reason why we want to look at this is everywhere people get frustrated about something, these are sources for improvement. If you get that far, then try and group it and discuss what you might be able to do uh, inside a team and what you would need, for instance, managers help with. So uh, with that, uh, we'll let you go out in the breakout rooms and then we'll have a 10 minute debrief and then a break. Which room would like to go first? You can share your screen and tell us about the sources of dissatisfaction then. I'll go for I'll go for team two. Thank yep. you. Please go ahead. Okay. Um I can share my screen, so I need to. You need to enable share screen sharing. Oh, sorry. Should I stop sharing my screen then? Uh, well, actually, here all participants can share the screen. Are you sure you cannot share? We have configured that already. No, it says you cannot start sharing screen while the other. Part, okay, so maybe she, Annette, has to st stop sharing. Yes, yes. Stop sharing. Mm. Mm. I have fixed that as well. Go ahead, please. So this is what we came up with in team two. We said the external, basically we look at the um, dependencies to other, other teams, then unclear roles and responsibilities. We talked about developing tasks, turning into research. And, you know, maybe at the point of um, agreeing on the contract, you know, the, the, um, the supplier basically thought it was just something to, to develop, but maybe due to lack of knowledge, they needed to do more research on exactly what the what we need, what the team requires. Then not knowing when things will get delivered. And then we said silo delivery days, lack of systems thinking, and then we looked at changing contract terms. Then for the internal, we looked at on clarity of definition of done, unclear roles and responsibilities, lack of knowledge within the team, and then you know. On that one, we also looked at um, team not being cross cross functional enough. You know, then much more to do than we have capacity for. You know, so then too many tasks in progress. Hmm. And with that, team members working in silos, and then lack of um, systems thinking. I'm just very curious. Can I ask a question, basically, basically for everybody? Uh, have any of you ever come across a team that was truly cross-functional and it's not a trick question i'm simply curious not not really not 100 percent 
you still have your specialist, whether you like it or not. Yeah, it's, it's very hard to get cross functional as a team. Uh, have oh, any oh. of you ever met T shaped people? He's not, not no. sure, or if we have just uh, talked about them, the T shaped people. But to some okay. extent, uh, as, as you continue collaborating with different teams, you get more and more. The, the top of the T would get wider and wider, I suppose. Well, thanks. This was just my curiosity. Sorry for interrupting you. I'll stop sharing that for team two. Thanks a lot. And uh, just a question for team two. Uh, do, do, you, do you get into a situation where you find, uh, I, I know that you are not truly a team that are collaborating on a daily basis, but in the teams that you're working with, do you see pride in what they're doing or do you see uh, uh, frustration of, of some sort for some reason? What, which of the two would you see more often? Again, purely curiosity. It, it varies, I think, over time. Now I'm not working in an agile uh, method. It's more, uh, it's a waterfall uh, process, uh, but getting closer to deadlines than according to the, the phases of the plan, it, we can, the, the frustration increases. While if you deliver good work, uh, find good solutions, there's a lot of pride in the team. So it varies. Sure, sure. Okay, should we take uh, the next team? Have we time for that, sign? Yeah, I would say we can take one more room. Let's, let's, let's hear the findings from one more room, please. Who would like to volunteer I for that? For, I can take for room three. Please go ahead. So in uh, room three, we discuss, let me share my screen here. In orange, we discussed cumbersome delivery process, a lot of red tape, lots of meetings. Team members are not following the agreed definition of done. We still have waterfall muscle memory in our, in our wings, in our muscles. Relatively immature teams in agile way of working depends on where they are in their journey. And of course, we should understand the cost of delay, what it means, uh, we, it's used in context of weighted shortest job first and uh, how the cost of delay can be visible because if it is visible we can manage it and uh, what other services we need for running the system um, like it's like what systemic barriers we can visualize to make sure or these are essentially bottlenecks the systemic barriers which impede the teams in its progress and then in green, we discussed cultural change and awareness. There's something uh, big thing. Agile is also about a cultural transformation. Agile, the backdrop of Agile is cultural transformation and uh, how we can collaborate as a team to get flow and also what external dependencies we have towards other teams like cross team dependencies and how we can make them visible you know, in a better way. Mm -hmm. Any questions on it? Uh, um, would you mind putting it up again, this, uh, this uh, spreadsheet? Sure. Yeah, okay. I, I mean, um, the dependencies is just uh, the worst ever. Uh, these dependencies and when you don't have this uh, um, uh, uh, you don't have this uh, complete knowledge in the team of, of, of what to do and that's really a bad one and again looking from a, a Kanban perspective uh, the cost of delay um, you can go very academic about it and calculate a lot of different things and I know that the way this showed it showed us job first and such it's also a calculation that's that's uh, at least for my not so mathematical brain a bit complicated but uh, i tend to like to view uh, the functions that i showed you just before because it's also a matter of getting this awareness that we need to to look at do we incur cost immediately or is it sometime out in the future so if you can make that kind of of, of change again 
slowly but surely and then you can become academic later on and make uh, difficult math mathematical uh, stuff mm -hmm. if you want to um, and 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 then I like your waterfall muscle memory because that's something that I guess I've been hit by uh, over and over and over again so thank you very much for that perspective yeah I see that uh, almost every day the waterfall muscle memory is hard to get rid of especially I work in automotive and uh, it's essentially a waterfall world uh, yeah. from for many decades yeah. yeah funnily enough when you think about uh, Toyota and Kanban, uh, which is also, of course, yeah, also, right. so of course. it's not that it can't be, gone, be done. Uh, but thank you very much. Do anybody else have questions uh, for Avnish? That doesn't seem to be the case. Do you guys need a break or do we continue? I would say we take a break, 10 minutes break. 10 minutes we've, break. Yeah, we've been talking for right. an hour and 20 minutes now. <laughs> yes, that's, so... That's quite all right. Mm -hmm. So uh, now we're going to look at the Kanban compared to Scrum and Safe. And I guess that uh, via your questions and the talks that we had, we have already discovered a few of them. But in Kanban, no organizational change is needed. And that means that it's easy to get started. Uh, where Scrum and Safe, and I, I, I guess I don't even have to say it, uh, but you need to change the organization, otherwise it, it, uh, it's not going to work. So you need to prepare quite a bit before you can get started. Um, you can argue then that, of course, you will prioritize in a, in a Scrum system, but um, we were just looking at the upstream board where the options were, were, were dealt with, and uh, the fact that you are prioritizing at the last responsible moment, you are, you are starting to, to, to uh, work with activities and moving them to the team board, that means that you're able to change your mind even very late in the, in the, um, in the cycle. Uh, and and uh, compared to Scrum and Safe, you're working with batches of activities that are moved to team boards each time a sprint starts. So that means that you're trying to predict uh, in safe a longer period, in scrum a shorter period, but you're trying to predict uh, what's going to happen in a certain period of time, where in Kanban you'll say, well, you can change your mind as much as you like to, as long as you don't change it once it has reached the downstream board, which only contains very, very few activities. And that's what's meant by starting uh, um, downstream activities at the latest responsible moment. Uh, you're aiming to work in an unbroken flow. Uh, so, so it's the flow that, that you are trying to control to see that, that your tasks are flowing smoothly through your downstream system, where in uh, uh, Scrum, and before you get mad at me, walking, working in small waterfalls, that their own, that's their own way of uh, describing what's happening in a sprint. So actually, each sprint is a mini project uh, with all the faces in it, maybe. And uh, Kanban can handle unpredictability and a mix of work. And that's, uh, that's uh, something that I'm, that I'm um, faced with very, very often, that even if in the ideal world, uh, world, you would only be working with a certain set of activities, developing something new or whatever it was, or whatever it might be, where in real life you all you very often see people that are that are developing something new, but they are also maintaining a system and carrying out operational tasks, and um, that means that it's it's next to impossible to plan ahead because you can't plan when incidents are going to occur or stuff like that. So uh, if you work with Scrum or Safe, it works absolutely best if you have predictability in your system and you don't get too many surprises working with uh, activities of a civil, similar nature, where in Kanban, the systems when, where, where you're working with different, a mix of work item types, uh, that could be development, maintenance, et cetera. Uh, that means that it's, you can actually build in uh, the way that you're dealing with unpredictability. Uh, and Kanban is not sensitive to part-time allocation where, where Scrum and Safe they are striving to have full-time allocations, preferably, 
and stable teams. In Kanban, if you have instability, it immediately reflects on your lead time. If you have somebody working only part-time and going back and forth, then that will reflect in longer lead time. And that's reality. So these are the main differences when you compare the systems, the flow system to, uh, uh, to the more uh, batch, um, uh, uh, batch like systems. And um, now we want to, sorry. I had a comment, a question about sure. Kanban. We, did we discuss that we limit the whip as well, the work in progress in, in Kanban? Yes. Of these is, uh, is resonating that idea. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last. I mean, uh, we are limiting the work as well in pro work in progress in Kanban. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I wonder where is it uh, like in these in this slide, do we see that in some other way or? Uh, that's the number three that you are you are moving uh, uh, stuff downstream at the latest responsible moment. So that means that since you are limiting the work in progress, you're also limiting the work in the queue. So let's say you have a team of, uh, I'm just mentioning a, a random figure, you are a team of five, then you might, you, you, you might have a team that were working with different things. So you need to, uh, to figure out what types of activities can I move into the downstream board so it fits with the competencies that we have and then make sure that there's always one activity to pull for each team member. Bearing in mind that you don't want to have a queue full of activities. You yeah. also restrict the limit in the queue and you don't start stuff until you know that I definitely want it. Right, thanks. So this is, this is probably where you can best see it. Um, I mean, also the fact that you're, you're not working in batches. You're not trying to predict what's going to happen two weeks from now, because if, if, if you're looking at even one week ahead, I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do Thursday next week for sure, even if I, I think that I'm quite well in control of my tasks. And it's not that I'm talking bad about uh, Scrum or Safe or anything. I'm working in a safe setting as uh, for, uh, for the time uh, at, at the moment. So it's not that I dislike it. I'm only trying to explain the differences, although my heart does beat a bit harder for Ken than I, I, I have to admit that. But we're working, I mean, in IT systems, we're working with a lot of unpredictability. Uh, and and uh, that's why you see, and I, I mean, I experience it all the time, that you do not meet, you, don't, you do not deliver the sprint goals you do not deliver the PI objectives because you are hit by something that you couldn't predict in any possible way, no matter how long time you spend on planning, because we're working with unknown unknowns. So in Kanban, we are trying to, to, uh, to deal with that risk by not starting things unless we know enough about it, and we're not starting it until the latest possible moment. Are there any other questions in, in this? So refinement would still be part of Kanban, even if you adopt Kanban in your daily work, refinements would still be crucial, right? That would, yeah, that's absolutely crucial because mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that's the key to any healthy system. If you don't, yeah. if you don't do the backlog refinement, then you're, you're merely guessing. So, so, so you're trying to figure out what the client wants. And that was one of the principles that we want to know exactly what the client wants because otherwise we cannot hit the nail. And that's why refinement is, is just as important in, in a Kanban system as a, a, in, any, in, in any other agile system. You're just doing it uh, in, our, in, in the upstream board and you are doing it you know, with, with, uh, with a kind of different perspective where you are having a workflow in your downstream as well saying, have we decomposed our tasks? Do we know enough about the risks? Do we know enough about dependencies? So we are analyzing that already upstream so we don't get any surprises or as few as possible once it gets moved into the downstream board. And that you could call backlog refinement for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a question from Marita in the chat. I think we should take it actually at this point yeah, in time. Go. 
Go ahead. Can uh, I read it, sorry? Yeah, should I, should I say it? Marita, <laughs> please go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Marita. Yeah. I'm a little bit curious around discussions we are having uh, because I've been uh, working in a context where we use SAFE in, in some certain way. And I also have teams that likes to work with Kanban since they feel that they have this unknown unknowns, so to say. But how do you, how ha, have your experience been with using uh, then Kanban in a safe context where you actually are trying to work in an increment sort of uh, procedure, you can say. Do you have any reflections there? Yeah, thank you for that question as well, because it's, it's, it's a good one too. Uh, and again, if you're looking, what we're looking at here, that's vanilla Kanban, right? It's, it's a Kanban University's way of, of uh, looking at Kanban also at the enterprise level. And I'll get back to that in a while. But when you are in a safe setting, you need to respect the rules around that. And, and again, uh, going back to, to the start, you start with what you do now. And if you do safe, you do safe. So you need to respect uh, the rules around, uh, around safe. So that means you need to work in batches. I'm not, uh, again, I'm, uh, how can I put this without uh, offending anybody because that's not what I'm up to, but, but I'm, I'm, not big, I'm not a big fan uh, of trying to predict the future three weeks ahead. I think it was even worse in the old waterfall projects where sometimes you would try to plan several years ahead. So no wonder that it didn't really succeed too often. Uh, but but it's it's very, very difficult to plan very much ahead. But if you need to do it, of course, you need to do it. But you will still stick to the Kanban practicing practices with limiting work in, in, in progress, visualizing as much as you can, uh, trying to, to visualize your, your blockers, try to analyze the data, uh, try to do all the stuff that we were talking about uh, in the last in the last hour's time, because these are practices that you could introduce no matter what you're working with. Uh, even you can, uh, I mean, I've been doing big programs in, in a Prince 2 setting where I had my Kanban board and introduced the visualization techniques, even if we were working in the Prince 2 phases. So, so Kanban can be combined with anything, anything, because here we are trying to organize the way we are working with our activities we are not organizing people or faces or anything else. Um, so, so you need to respect when you're working in a safe setting. I would have a good look at some of the slides to see, okay, what, which of these practices can I introduce and, and, and maybe minimize some of the risks that we are facing in terms of blockers, dependencies, all the things that we were talking about that are really disturbing flow. Yeah. I, I totally agree, and that is a little bit what we have done, actually. We are trying to create some goals on what we consider is the value we want to bring out. And then also, as you said, talking about the dependencies, getting the flow out, understanding, uh, I mean, the different steps in the Kanban that the team is using. So, yeah. thank you. Welcome. So let's look at Kanban systems and the communication model, because I've been talking about systems thinking, but what do we really mean when we're looking at Kanban? And the fact of the matter is that if you want to, you can start Kanban in a single team, just like we talked about before, where you say, well, we have our uh, uh, agile team in SAFE, and now we decide to work in, in a more Kanbanized way, you could say. Uh, that's perfectly fine. And here we have the replenishment meeting, uh, which uh, or, or I'm just going to, to uh, uh, start over again. In the Kanban team, you have the daily Kanban meeting. And these, these cadences, they are not a dictate. If you decide in your, in your team that it doesn't really uh, give us anything to, to meet every day, let's, let's meet three times a week, that's perfectly fine. But you need to change it for good reasons. Uh, so these are suggestions and these are good practices that have emerged all over the world when working in Kanban systems. So these are not, uh, these are not uh, prerequisites or dictates. These are suggestions uh, that, that is based on good Kanban practice. But what you do have, you do have a replenishment meeting because you need to have that upstream way of thinking where you're looking at your backlog 
uh, as one big pile of options that you can decide to do or not to do. And you need to know what of, which of these options are the, the ones that are most important and should be put into the board of the Kanban, uh, of the Kanban team whenever there's room for that. And when you then look in the other, in the other end to the right, uh, then you'll have the delivery planning meeting because very often it's a problem when you go from having developed something and now you need to, 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 put, it, um, to put it in production. Then there is, uh, uh, then the chain breaks because they might be working in a whole different rhythm. And we are trying to, in a Kanban system, to make agreements about how do we deal when we are done with something? How, do, how does it get put into production in the most efficient way, way so that we can reduce customer lead times as much as possible? Because every time, uh, if, you, if, if, if you see the teams that are just saying, well, now I'm done, I'm just throwing it over the fence, and then you're hoping for somebody to catch it. We want to make this more structured and to agree with whoever is receiving the results of the work that we have been doing. Something is coming your way, and uh, can we agree how we can put this to use for the end users in, in the quickest and the most uh, safe possible way? And, and this is what's going on in the delivery planning meeting. You might also have Kanban in more than one team, and they will have the same cadence of replenishment meetings looking at the upstream Kanban. You will have your daily Kanban meeting or weekly, twice a week, however many times, and you will have your delivery planning meeting and you will have the service delivery review. And this is where you're discussing are we good at working cross teams when, when we need each other? Are we helping each other out? And are we smoothing the way uh, for each other so that we can make sure that we are delivering value as quickly, as efficiently as possible? Because if these teams start to get uh, in an infight about who is more important, then that's where the trouble begins. And that, that's why in the service delivery review, we need to have a common view of what is more important than other things and i'm going to ask you a rhetorical questions have you uh, a question have you ever experienced that there are more than one team wanting to work with one specialist this only guy or this only girl that knows how to work with this particular system maybe a legacy system i'm sure that the answer to that question will be yes and this is yeah. why we need to sorry yes yeah it is yes isn't it uh, and this is why we need to agree. So of all these teams, who is working with the most important thing so that any bottleneck resources can be allocated to the team that's doing the most important stuff first. And I mean, it's, it's uh, common sense condensed, but it's really, really difficult to get to that agreement because people tend to think that what I'm working on, of course, that's most important. And this is why we need to have agreement across the silos maybe, uh, across departments maybe, uh, so that there, there is a common understanding of what, which is more important than the other things. So we can allocate the resources and use scarce resources in the most efficient and value creating way. And the suggestion is that you are having a meeting like this bi-weekly. Then we're moving up to the enterprise level. And this is where we are keeping a strict focus on cross team dependencies. And we are doing that in an operations review and the people that are participating, these are the managers and they are accountable of helping the teams to remove uh, or, or smooth the way by, by minimizing the weight of the dependencies. And uh, on the right hand side, you'll see the risk review. Uh, and the suggestion is also that you are having a risk review monthly. Again, we are having managers sitting there and saying, okay, it seems like we are blocking the way for each other. How can we reduce risk, reduce customer lead times by having a common focus on these blockers and what to do about them? And again, this is all data-based as uh, the graphs here suggests. And we are looking at, in this case, you are seeing a picture of a lead time distribution because lead time is not a bullseye, that's a distribution, uh, as I mentioned earlier today, where sometimes some, a, a task of a certain nature might take 
uh, five days and sometimes it takes longer time. And this is what is suggested by what we call the tail of the lead time. The longer the tail, the more unpredictability in your system. So this is what we are focusing on on the risk review. How can we, how can we shorten that tail and minimize risk by doing so? And then when you are going all in on Kanban, using it on the strategic level as well, you are having a strategy review. Suggestion is quarterly. The tendency is annually, which is actually a bad idea. But in these days and age uh, where, where things are changing so rapidly, to look at the strategy once a year, Kanban suggests that that's a little too rarely. Uh, if you're looking at Kanban at this level, that would usually require, require Kanban software, for instance, enterprise services planning by Digity that can, that can uh, uh, encompass all of these reviews and have loads of data and decision points and what have you. So uh, when you're looking at the strategic, um, uh, the strategic elements, this is where you're setting the scene for what the company is going to do. And actually nothing is happening in the teams unless it's part of the strategy. And when you're looking at the operations review and the service delivery review and the risk review, these are what are driving improvement uh, for organizational agility. So uh, when, you, when you are at the team level, you are mainly focusing on service delivery of, a set of one kind of service or a combination that align within the same uh, field, you could say. And then when you're expanding it, this is where you're getting the improvements on, on the bigger scale. Any questions uh, around the communication model and the Kanban systems way of thinking? And again, even if it's difficult to see on such a, a flat, flat slide, this is actually uh, this this can this can be the full organization all the departments all the teams all whatever you have that are uh, that are uh, maintained in in this model no questions but again we're trying to uh, structure the way we're building our system so we are focusing uh, strictly on certain things when we are having certain meetings. Then, um, I don't know if you've heard about Kanban's maturity model, but in my, in my honest opinion, this is one of the most important things that have happened uh, in the agile scene for ages. Uh, and unfortunately, there's, no, no, there's not much time to uh, dig into the details here. Uh, but what I uh, will uh, go through is uh, you're looking at the scope for, for the teams that are uh, or, or the scope of what is going on, where when you are at a very low maturity level, you are mainly task focused. You are looking at individualism and you are having people saying, well, I don't care what everybody else is doing. I'm doing my stuff and I'm doing my thing and nobody should touch my systems because they are mine. So, so uh, you are having this individual way of thinking that, uh, that is not very uh, mature. And actually that's what David Anderson calls uh, oblivious. There's no understanding why a systematic approach or a disciplined approach is even worthwhile thinking about. And even uh, thinking in systems, the way that I just showed you before, it's something that they that they they don't really they don't really see the benefits of of uh, working in this way, and then moving up the the um, maturity ladder, you'll get uh, to a scope where it's the deliverables you are looking at. You are getting more team focused, but you are still relying on individual heroes. Uh, you are relying on this guy. Uh, how lucky to have Peter because. He's the one that's always walking the extra mile or doing overtime or working in weekends to make this happen. But, but heroes, independent on whether they are individuals or managers, it's not really a sign of good health in the system because you shouldn't be depending on any one person 
or even a uh, few persons, you should have a system that is working smoothly. And then uh, as you move up, then you get more customer driven, you get fit for purpose, you are starting to think about products and services. And that's the, the service, uh, the network of services that I started with talking about when we were looking at uh, the Kanban principles. Uh, moving further up, you're looking at product lines as a services portfolio, so on and so forth. And you are starting to look at the customers, what, what, is, what are their needs? And once you get up to the risk hedged, <coughs> the, the level four, this is where you have unity and alignment. Alignment across silos, alignment across departments, across teams, etc. And then the last one's market leader, pursuit of perfection and built for survival and reinvention. Uh, that's that's uh, um, actually that's meant in a way that you are uh, you are very focused about what's going on in the market. Is something happening out there? Let me just mention a, a company as like a blockbuster. They discovered too late that there was something new going on, so they couldn't reinvent themselves in a way in a robust way, uh, so so that they could maintain their relevance in their market. So that's what you're aiming at when you're moving up this ladder. ladder. And the good thing about it, what you cannot see behind me, but what I'm just going to point to, uh, the maturity model here, and I don't expect you to be able to read anything, but there are posters and you can find them if you go to the website that I note here, kanbanmaturitymodel.com, where there are many posters telling you exactly what activities that you can work with to increase your maturity and move from one level to the next. So this is what we mean when we say that it's actionable guidance. Uh, and that guidance can be found in the maturity model. And uh, don't, don't worry about this being called the Kanban maturity model, because even if it is, there are plenty of good stuff to be found that you can use anywhere that you, uh, that you would actually like to. So uh, this is just a, a, a small uh, sample or taste of what you can find in the, in the book of Kanban Maturity Model, which was, which was written by David Anderson and one of his colleagues that describes all of these levels that I've been talking about here. But the fact of the matter is that you are having a roadmap for improvement. How can I move from the level we are on now to the next one, to the next one, to the next one? In Kanban, we are talking about false summit plateaus. This means that you have reached a certain level of agility, and then you believe, okay, that's it, now we are agile. But there are always a next step to take, and a next step, and a next step. And this is what we are uh, getting, um, uh, this is what is explained in the Kanban maturity model. This, the improvement never stops, but there is, there, there is a model for this. And this is what you see here. And now we're not going to do the, the, next, uh, the next exercise until, unless, uh, let's see here, we are uh, some 10 minutes behind time. So we could, we, I, I don't know, what do you say, sorry? I'll, I'll ask for your advice. Do you think that it's wise to uh, go into the breakouts or, uh, should we just have a discussion or uh, uh, you get the possibility to ask questions as many as you want until we reach uh, 7.30? What do you uh, think, Sam? I, I would say let's open the table for questions and, uh, That's, and have uh, a discussion. I, yes, yes, I would say that. Yeah. I Great. have questions myself as well. I'm going to type them in the chat. <laughs> Are you, uh, and again, you're welcome if, if I'm saying something and you think that it's, you have questions that relates to what I've just been talking about, don't hesitate, just go ahead and ask your questions. But otherwise, uh, I will continue with the static steps. And that was the systems approach to introducing Kanban. And uh, what we actually did was to do step number two in the last exercise because I wanted to show you uh, or give you a taste of uh, how we are working with determining 
how should our Kanban system be built? Uh, and when you're looking at the sources of dissatisfaction, you are very often going to find some patterns uh, where, where you say, well, communication is not flowing freely, or as uh, the two teams that were sharing their uh, results with us, they were saying, we have a lot of dependencies, or we don't have the capacity. And actually, when you think of it, that's very strange, because looking at SAFE, it's recommending that you don't load your, your teams or yourselves with more than 80%. Uh, in Kanban, you can't overload a Kanban system because you have limited the work in progress. You, you cannot overload a Kanban system. And that's one of the beauties of it. When you're looking at, at Scrum, it's the team that determines how much can they take into a sprint, depending on their capacity and their, their, their historic velocity, stuff like that. Um, but still we see over and over again that we are having more work than we have the capacity to do. And how can that happen? Uh, and that's one of the uh, sources of dissatisfaction that you brought up. And what we want to do with this is to have a discussion about, okay, so if we are unha unhappy about the way we are dealing with cost dependencies, what can we do? What can we do ourselves? Because in many cases, and again, turning the clock back to when, when I talked about uh, uh, demonstrating leadership at all levels of the organization. Here we are asking the team to show leadership and discuss what can we do in our team uh, to uh, mitigate the risks of dependencies or blockers or whatever else. Because in many cases, it's a matter of having bad habits in the team, uh, in the organization that you could decide to stop having or try to change them at least by doing these experiments that I was talking about or, or uh, evolutionary change that I was talking about. But one of the keys to finding what needs to be improved is to look at the sources of dissatisfaction. And some of the patterns that I most often see is that uh, we, are, we are lacking uh, uh, lacking leaders that truly understand what agile, what agile is all about. And this is not something I'm saying to, again, I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm currently working with the management team uh, to try and explain to them what is expected in an agile system from the way that they are doing their leadership so that it supports agile thinking and it supports their agile teams in the best possible way. And I guess it's to the greater good of everybody because if managers are able to uh, play with the teams, they are getting quicker results. And again, that's one example of uh, a source of dissatisfaction that I often come across. I, I often come across uh, something around communication. We don't know enough. Very often, uh, one of the sources is, uh, uh, of dissatisfaction is, yes, we have a backlog, but we see uh, requirements coming in from everywhere. People are tapping me on the back and saying, please, Aneta, can you just do this for me? Or it's only five minutes and then five minutes become half a day. And all of a sudden uh, you have missed some time that you should have done working on items that were planned, prioritized, estimated, and the rest of it. And that's what's, what lies within the point of uh, the point three uh, and, and that's, yeah, analyze the sources of and nature of demand. How does new demand arrive to your team? Can it be via mail? Is your backlog, are you one of these lucky guys or girls that have a backlog and nothing arrives to your team unless it's been through the product owner or the service request manager and being prioritized? Or are you one of the unlucky ones that get tapped on the back, get mails or phone conversations or, or managers coming and escalate stuff, which is actually disrupting what you're doing. Point number four is you analyze the current delivery capability because you need to have balance between demand and supply. And you know, when you're looking at having too much on your plate, you're having too many activities, too many things to do compared to your capacity, then, uh, then there isn't a respect for getting that balance between supply and demand. And you should analyze why that happened and you should try if, if you can fix it. It's very difficult because in many cases, it's your managers that are having bad habits 
and coming and uh, and they are coming and pushing activities to your team, even if your PI have been locked or your sprint has been locked. So in many cases, it's the system surrounding the agile teams that are actually causing disruption in a good way of working. Uh, but in Kanban, we are modeling, uh, we are analyzing the capability and we are putting the, the limits for work in progress they are put in accordance, in accordance with the capabilities we have. So if you don't do anything else, then at least agree, none of us have more than two activities going on and at any given time. You have a task, if that gets blocked, you have a buffer task, no more. And that's an agreement I've made with, with many, many teams, it can be done. And that's one way of, of, of not getting the feeling of having too much on your plate, because you can only see two activities uh, as a member of a team. And then you model the service delivery workflow. And again, I'm not trying to offend any uh, Scrum fans here, but in Kanban, it's not a, a, a workflow to have to do doing done because you cannot see, have you just started or are you almost complete? So we need to know a bit more. We need to know if it's, if it's necessary to maybe analyze something before you start maybe you need to break something down further you need to uh, determine what does it take to to do this uh, task whatever then you go ahead and you develop or, or it's ongoing then you probably need to quality assure you might need to introduce whatever you have made to some end users or some users so usually you will have a workflow that's a, a bit longer than to do doing and done but what you need to do is you need to analyze it so that you can make sure that the most complicated activity that you have in your Kanban system can fit this workflow. Then there might be less complicated activities and they can skip workflow stages. Let's imagine that you are developing something new and it's going through all the stages and then you are fixing errors of something you made before. You don't have to analyze that a lot and you may not have to involve a user to test it, but you can just determine in your own team, does it work or doesn't it? So it's skipping some stages, but you need to make a board that has room for even the most complex stuff that you're doing. And then you identify and you define classes of service. And the reason why it's red, that's because the activity we were doing is concerning uh, classes of service, where I wanted you to think about how can you divide whatever you're doing into different classes of service, depending on the way that you are handling them. And again, think back to the flight passengers. Some flight passengers have paid more uh, and therefore they get a different treatment. Some passengers on your Kanban board are more important and they have a cost of delay that is immediately very expensive and they should be worked with before the ordinary stuff, the standard tasks, intangibles or whatever else. And then you design the Kanban system. And the reason why point two and seven is uh, put into this box, that's because this is what you're usually working with in not so mature teams. And uh, uh, just to return briefly to the maturity model, uh, it's very common to see uh, teams of maturity level zero and one. It's good if you're maturity level two, and the hardest jump to make is going from level two to level three. Uh, but once you go, if you are lucky enough to be in a situation where you're very mature, this is where one and eight comes into play, where you understand what makes our service fit for purpose. What are the criteria? What are the, how can we identify that this, uh, uh, this service is actually fit for purpose? And then in eight, that's where you have a, a consensus in this in your organization that this is the way we are working. So you are socializing, you're designing, and you're negotiating the implementation across uh, across more than one team, across several teams, probably possibly across several departments. And this is how you go about introducing Kanban. So it's not uh, it's not. Uh, Geronimo, let's make a Kanban board. No, we are sitting down to analyze what is going on in our system. What are we working with? 
what are the different uh, uh, work item types, et cetera, et cetera. And then once you have defined all of that, then you design the Kanban system. And the first one you design is for sure not the, the last one you design because you get wiser as you go along. Once you start working with your Kanban system, uh, then it will evolve. Uh, it will evolve and uh, you may want to change something. And uh, if, you know, when, when you discuss when to change things, that should be for good reasons because data have shown you that improvements are needed. And you might want to discuss that in your uh, retrospectives uh, because Kanban, you can have retrospectives, even if it was not in the communication model, it's very usual to have retrospectives, maybe once a month or so, where you're looking at the systems and asking yourselves, are we following the rules? Uh, are we respecting the, the limits uh, that we have set for the work in progress? Or uh, are we having too many blockers? Do we know why they're blocked? How can we improve our system uh, when you're looking at it end to end? So, any I, questions at this point? Yes, I have a question. I, I wrote it, but I hope that it's not. So, but maybe you have answered it by the, this slide. <laughs> it's a very long question, but um, so we have many intangible tasks. And uh, so we struggle a little bit between the upstream and uh, downstream. Uh, our current solution is to have a, what we call a prioritized backlog. And from that, we take a maximum of 10 tasks to the, which we select to ready for development. But I mean, 40 is, uh, we have 40. Uh, task in this backlog, but sometimes like this week it was 75 and it's, it's oh too much. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and um, some quite often tasks uh, go and go and die, so we reject them late. Um, but maybe that's good, I don't know, but it's also frustrating for the team. So, yeah. uh, the, the sound, I'm, I'm sorry, but the sound is not very good. But your, the okay. question itself, what was, uh, would you please, would you mind repeating it? I wrote it in the, in the chat as well. You. Okay, let me, let me check the, the, the chat. I'm sorry about that. Um, here we go. There are many tangible standards that are ready for development. We currently put these in prioritized backlog to get a web limit of 40, but 75, oh my. Um, yes. So we actually have a, a good working Kanban for the, as you call it, the downstream. Yeah. But the problem is that upstream yeah, the, uh, yeah, I can see that. And, and then maybe you want to work with uh, the way that you are prioritizing or, or the way that you are determining, determining whether some, something is worthwhile working on uh, or not. And what, what I tend to do is that I'm, I'm, I don't mind that stuff is getting in, but then when we are, are you having replenishment meetings? Yes. Yeah. So do you then discuss, uh, I mean, Sometimes it's a matter of going through the activities and then making a very, very quick selection. Does this seem like something that's really important? Should we discuss it now? No, then out, out with that. And then you just leave it for some time later to see if it, if it ever gets important. And we, I, I also tend to, to keep track on when something has arrived to my upstream board. And in case it's been there for a long time, I just kick it out. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and, and I know that that can be very provoking to some people because uh, they, they many tend to believe that uh, when somebody has asked, asked for something, it must be important, but that's not always the case. Um, uh, and you say that you're not really happy with this setup. Well, in fact, in fact, there's also a, another way around it because I don't know if you ever tried to uh, 
to take your Kanban uh, downstream board and try and distribute it in swim lanes, uh, uh, how much effort you're, you're putting on intangible work and on standard tasks and on important things. But um, that, there are different ways to go about it so that you get a sorting mechanism and you don't get too absorbed in looking at at uh, many, many intangible tasks, which by definition is not exactly important right now, but put your focus on only stuff that's really important, like the expedite, like the fixed date stuff, and then just forget the rest. Uh, but the problem is maybe that as we work, this is a DevOps team. So yes. the intangible things are often the, the ops uh, things, operation tasks. Okay. Okay. They, yeah, so they will get important if you don't do them, but currently they are not important. But are you lose, are you using the cost of delay functions? I mean, your intangibles, does that not have an impact if, if, if it's the operations kind of thing? It doesn't, it doesn't sound exactly necessarily intangible to me, but again, I don't know if we can uh, get into any kind of, uh, of in-depth. Uh, I, I think it's difficult to answer until yeah. I've seen your board, with it, which is unfortunately not possible right at this yeah. moment. But I, yeah, I might, I might uh, say that you would want to maybe look at the cost of delay functions to determine, are, are we really working with the right uh, classes of service or dealing with them in, in, in the way that it was actually meant? Uh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I will, I will try that. Yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, you were you you added, sorry, that lower levels of maturity are usually called prototype Kanban. That's correct. Uh, proto Kanban, where where you're doing uh, some, you're using some of the practices, but not all of them. And that's absolutely correct because as as uh, as I mentioned before, we want to have uh, we are looking for incremental improvements. So if we are if we are trying to do too much at the same time, it's going to fall apart. So that means that, for instance, let me take as an example, you are having loads of dependencies, you are having loads of blockers, and in a in a in a real Kanban system, they would count in the work in progress limits as well. So if you've set the limit to five and you have four items blocked, then you can only work with one, no matter how big your team is. And that's something that's really frustrating to people because they're just sitting there idle and what can we do? Uh, and, and, and then that's where you, you have to be pragmatic. Uh, and that's where, where uh, as Kenvan mentioned, pragmatic, actionable, evidence-based guidance so we don't want to sit high on the Kanban hose and say, you need to do all of this because otherwise you don't have a Kanban system. It's not the Kanban system in itself that's important. Flow is important. So we need to focus as much as we can on improving flow from the state where we are now, improving bit by bit by bit. And that's why you will have, you will very often at the maturity level zero and one, you will have proto Kanban systems for sure. And thanks for that comment, uh, uh, Sai. That's that's absolutely correct. Sure. Uh, the, the, we have actually two other questions that Lars posted earlier in the Please. chat. Uh, so the first question: Do you have examples of companies that work uh, with uh, this way, fully through? Um, and what I, he I, means, what he mean by that is focus on service delivery. Uh, drive improvements and also setting the scenes. So all those levels. Any examples yes. on companies that actually do that in full? That's the question. Yes, yes, there are examples, and, and and I have a few examples. But what I would suggest is that you go to the Kanban University site because there are many case studies there where you can you can see how people that were uh, uh, struggling for some reasons. They, they went all in on this. But one thing I can, uh, I can mention is that uh, I went to a, a visit. I was, I was uh, in a master class with uh, David Anderson, a coaching master class, and we were visiting a company that had got, gone all in on Kanban. 
they were uh, you you know these um traveling companies what are they called it's like like ticket masters uh, ticket masters things like that selling airplane tickets and and there's a fierce competition and they had had red figures uh, for for the past couple of years and uh, they were discussing between themselves should we simply go should we accept to go bankrupt or should we look at the way that we are working then they decided to go uh, all in on Kanban, and that means that was it was from the very highest level of top bosses, the CEO, uh, CIO, C whatever. Uh, uh, they said we need to go all in on Kanban, and I went through this company and looked at uh, so many different types of Kanban boards. They were looking completely different because it's up to each team to determine how does our Kanban board look needs to be fitting. And then there were there were some um, uh, a few Kanban coaches that would be dealing with uh, dependencies across teams. So anything that one team couldn't handle, I mean bilateral uh, with another team, that would be dealt with by by uh, these Kanban coaches. They had decided to work with product owners, and that's fine because that's a concept that's uh, widely acknowledged and is. Uh, uh, a very, I mean, it's a concept that that many people understand and is so so uh, such a big part of the agile DNA. So no problem, product owners doesn't matter if it was originally a Scrum concept. They were using product owners, and then they were having all these meetings that we were talking about before. And within one single year, they turned around uh, a, a minus something to a plus, I believe, if I remember correctly, it was a plus 4% or no, it was a plus 7%, which is really, really high in that in that line of business. So the margin uh, uh, improved dramatically and everybody kept their jobs. They were working across three different location locations and I forget how many people they were, but this was an end-to-end -end Kanban implementation. And you can find uh, more example of uh, more examples of this uh, on the on the Kanban University websites, where where it has been uh, demonstrated uh, how how people have uh, used the Kanban methods to make turnarounds of different types. Another and that's a curious example actually, because that was a Chinese bank, and they were working in uh, Beijing, and they were very successful, extremely successful. So their bottlenecks was actually the physical building. They wanted to hire more people because the customers were happy. They were getting more customers in, but they didn't have room for new employees. So they were they were uh, they were discussing how can we how can we make ourselves more efficient so we don't need these new employees so we can make do with the people that we have, and they actually started um, simultaneously. A scrum project and a kanban project to see could kanban really work and it did and then they changed and they they started to to uh, use all the principles and it's not that it's some it's not an easy ride it's something that you need to the the higher up the decision is made the easier it is to make it work because if it's the ceo that says for instance in the travel company if you want to keep your job it's kanban uh, then there's not so much discussion as if it's a, a team member that let's say, hey, by the way, I've heard about Kanban. I, I think it's a brilliant idea. So it does matter at which level the decision is made. But again, back to the Chinese bank, they started to work with Kanban. They improved their processes. They improved the way they were working across teams and all the rest of it. And they had plenty of room in their building in Beijing. So there can be different kinds of bottlenecks or there can be different kinds of, of uh, uh, obstacles that can um, uh, facilitate uh, that, that Kanban is brought into play. So certainly uh, those companies exist, but in many cases it's, it's difficult because of the, the um, uh, those myths that I was talking about at first, because as you understand now, probably Kanban is quite a sophisticated system. It's not just for small operations teams, but this myth, it really exists very widely. So for, for managers to take that decision, 
it means that they need to be aware that Kanban is not what they think it is and to make that move and not ju just do what everybody else is doing. Uh, so yeah, let's see, maybe in the future, I hope. Anita, I mean, listening to, to these use cases that you have uh, just presented, I cannot help but thinking about the uh, product adoption uh, life cycle, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, the, they call it the Rogers bill curve. Maybe I can, maybe I can share my screen here if it's okay. Yeah, that's okay. That's fine. Um, and while you do that, uh, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, while you do that, I'll mention uh, because I don't know if we have time to. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's, that's right. right. Hmm? Mm. That's that right. Hmm. So when you said uh, they have a lot of competitors, so uh, the the ticket distribution company. So we are we are talking here, right, in the mainstream yeah. market. You are here in this segment, basically. And if you don't do something about it, if you don't innovate, then the we adoption. Yes. Then you will die. Then, then you will die. Then the adoption of your product will will gradually, yeah. yeah, shrink and shrink, and you just die. That's why what what what, what happens here is that uh, uh, giant companies, what they do at the, in, in this phase, they are in this phase. What they do is that they start acquiring smaller businesses, right? They start buying smaller businesses because they are in this point. Uh, they are not as enthusiastic about innovation anymore. So they start like buying smaller businesses in order to cope with it, and they don't fade out and die in the market. Mm. And, and you could also say that depending on uh, how much you have at stake, uh, if, if things are going quite well, if things are going all right, what is your incentive to improve? Unless if you're an agile nerd such as myself, uh, I'm always looking for ways to improve. But it's, it's much more easy to just do, keep doing what you always did rather than keep searching, pushing yourself uh, in a in a more and more agile direction. So the more skin in the game you have, the more the more tempted you are to to look for these improvements. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I would like to to mention uh, these last uh, few slides that I have, very few slides actually. Uh, ooh, where am I? Uh, here we are. Uh, I'm going to mention very briefly, because we are getting closer to the end, that if you are tempted to know more about Kanban, and, and this is just coincidentally that, uh, that I'm, uh, I'm uh, teaching a course uh, in the Kanban Management Professional that consists of two courses, KMP1 and KMP2, where you have the Kanban systems design that, that is working with the static model that I talked about before, and also the Kanban systems improvement, where you're looking at how can we involve Kanban systems beyond the team level. So this is just for you to know. I'm not trying to sell anything. It's just a piece of information. And the course can be uh, will be conducted in English if there are English speaking, speaking people. Uh, and other than that, back to your questions. Uh, and also, by the way, you're welcome to Link if you're interested in, in uh, linking on LinkedIn or following me on, on Facebook or whatever, you're welcome to doing that as well. And now I said what I want to say, and then it's uh, over to you if there are any more last minute questions. Uh, there is yet one more a question, Anita, again from Lars. Do you include the time on the upstream board in the total customer lead time, or is it only the time on the downstream board? The downstream board, that's the system lead time, because this is where you're looking at an individual team. How long time does it take to do their part of the job? So if you're looking at customer lead time, you will look from the very first team that starts working on whatever this customer have requested until it has been put into production after the last team has worked with it. And that's what that means that that includes also the, the time it's stuck in the upstream system uh, in a team. And this, this is why it's so very, very important. And that doesn't really matter if it can ban or say for anything else, that there is agreement in, in, in the management team, in the silos about what, which activities or projects 
are more important than other activities or projects because you're working with scarce resources, you're working with specialists, and you're working sometimes in super tankers that, that, uh, that cannot work like Spotify that, that you often hear about. You cannot be both big and small at the same time. So here we are trying to make a system that respects that, yes, you may be big, but still we are trying to improve what goes on in this very big system. Uh, but surely the customer lead time, you need to measure it end to end from the, ta from the project or the task or whatever you're doing started until the customer has the, the, the nice package in his or her hand. Okay, uh, thank you. Yet another question from Anna that just popped up in the chat. So how is client feedback handled in Kanban? Well, the client feedback you can you can uh, you can include. For instance, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be strange if you had clients involved in the replenishment meetings, and you you might also uh, uh, get the feedback uh, when you are looking at. Um, uh, I mean, you can have any meetings with the clients to determine whether the the uh, the quality was as expected, but you are involving the clients in the upstream part of the of the tasks and also determining if this is where we are now, what do we need to work with next? And this is where you can get the feedback too on, 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 uh, on the quality. And then surely you'll get the feedback after, uh, after it has been put to, to production somehow. But you don't have this cycle, cycle. I mean, you can have customer feedback, as I mentioned, when you have your, your, your weekly replenishment meeting, or you might introduce any other kind of meeting because the meetings that I showed you, these are uh, these are uh, the Kanban cadences that you that you uh, work with when you are looking at a Kanban system. But you are having uh, feedback loops with anybody that can help you improve quality, improve flow, in, improve the way you're working, improve your processes, improve whatever, because you are hunting down these incremental improvements or these. Uh, um, uh, evolutionary changes that I was talking about by talking with anybody that can help you. So if you can see that you are having issues with the quality, the, uh, it's put to production and you get them back because this was not what the customer expected. And you will see rework being done. This is what you would be talking about in the retrospective. Why are we seeing so many things getting back to us? Do we not, uh, are we not in control of, of our definition of done? And even if we have our definition of done, do we use it or is it just being kept in the drawer? We made it at one point because uh, the method said we had to make this, but then we never use it. I mean, what good is it? And this is why we want to talk about explicit rules. So the definition of done is, is put on the wall. And I mean, in these Corona days where everybody is working uh, from home, that is very difficult, but it, they should be visible. They should be explicit. Uh, so that you know uh, how are we supposed to work and then you discuss are we following the rules are we keeping our work in progress limits do we see many blockers are we trying to handle them proactively etc etc so you you will see the results of the way you're working uh, in some way or the other as we work as many many errors as bugs as uh, customer complaints or whatever and that's when you're looking at yourself again. I sometimes I tend to say that Kanban is putting a big mirror up in front of your organization and and showing you this is how you're working. Do you like it? Is there something that you would like to change, or are you happy with the way things are going? 